Welcome back to another episode of Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. My name is Josh, and today I'm joined once again by my illustrious co-host, Dr. Michael Fernando. How are you going, Michael? Very good, Josh. And to yourself? I cannot complain, and we have another blockbuster episode in store for our listeners today. So our podcast, for those who are first-time listeners, or even those who are been with us since the start. We are the podcast that aims to demystify, break down the concepts, and really give a bare-bones analysis of up-to-date trials and where they fit in the wonderful world and rapidly evolving world of oncology. Today, we will be talking about the GI 2023 ASCO update. Well, you said it. It's a blockbuster in the same vein as Jaws, Jurassic Park, and Star Wars. Exactly. Um, Those three. Or alternatively, for those who don't like those blockbusters, I'm a huge fan of... I can't remember the movie. Is it Time Machine? Doesn't matter. (laughs) You're such a huge fan of it, you can't even remember it. Can't remember it. Um, It's just been burned It does not matter. But today, I think, Michael, you're take us in and we'll talk about a new pancreatic regimen and an update for this. Thank you, Josh. Uh, today is going to be a bit different. Our, uh, we're not going to sort of yammer on about two studies. We're going to talk in slightly more detail or slightly less detail about more studies. Um, and first cab off the rank is Napoli 3. Now this is a one in uh, a line of uh, studies that are looking at liposomal irinotecan. Um, irinotecan obviously is a tentpole, I'm using that word today a lot Josh, is a tentpole drug in the GI space. We use it as part of fulfirinox in pancreatic cancer. We also use it extensively in uh, cancers of both the upper and lower GI tract. But this is a pancreatic study and that in itself is a bit, um, I guess, notable in that the presence of a new pancreatic study is always met with uh, a little bit of hope, but I guess these days quite a bit of skepticism because there hasn't been a massive advance, as we've said in our previous pancreatic cancer episode, and you know, should go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But um, our previous, as we said in that that episode, pancreatic cancer is one of the more static um, areas of oncology. There hasn't been very much uh, in the way of advancement. So this is one that I guess is uh, something to look at with a little bit of trepidation. So liposomal irinotecan, much like liposomal doxorubicin, is a chemotherapy attached to a um, a protein molecule, the idea being that it enhances delivery to the cancer cell. Napoli-3 is a study of liposomal irinotecan plus fluorouracil leucovorin uh, plus oxaliplatin, a regimen that has got the very snazzy title of nalirifox, as opposed to fulfirinox. It's basically fulfirinox, but um, liposomal irinotecan. So this was a randomized open-label phase 3 trial, and it enrolled patients with metastatic pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma who were treatment naive and had metastatic disease. Metastatic disease had to be diagnosed six weeks or less before screening and their eco performance status had to be zero to one. We've talked a lot about how pancreatic patients are frequently quite frail, their disease is, signif- is frequently advanced by the time they come to our attention and yet the runners of the study still managed to rustle up 770 people who were randomized one to one. Now the two arms were the Naliri Fox, um, which was liposomal irinotecan, fluorouracil, and oxaliplatin with some leucovorin sprinkled in there as well, which was given on day one and 15 of a 28-day cycle, effectively every two weeks. But the reason they had the 28-day cycle is to uh, ease uh, for ease of comparison, because the comparator arm is gemcitabine and napaclitaxel, uh, which is the Uh, or we should say a standard of care for metastatic pancreatic cancer. Debate abounds as to whether it's actually better than fulfirinox, but um, there you go. That's the uh, comparator they decided to use. Uh, 
Treatment was given, as is always, with gemabraxane on days 1, 8, and 15 of a 28-day cycle. So that's why they um, had the uh, Nelly Refox as a 28-day cycle as well. Disease was continued into a progressive disease, unacceptable toxicity, or steady withdrawal. And the primary endpoint was overall survival, with the secondary endpoints being progression-free survival and overall response rate. In terms of the baseline characteristics, the median age was 65. There was a slight pre- uh, predominance of uh, men. There was a significant predominance of Caucasian uh, background. And uh, a little over half of the patients had an ECOG performance status of 1. Um, there was a fairly broad distribution of number of metastatic sites, about a third across 1, 2, and greater than 3. So these aren't necessarily people who have very low volume disease. Almost everyone, 80% of patients, had liver metastases. One thing I thought was interesting, Josh, is that the main pancreatic tumor lesion, actually for the majority of patients, about two-thirds, was not the head of the pancreas, which is interesting to me because the head of the pancreas seems always to be the most most common or most quote-unquote typical site. Interesting. Um, not really sure why that is, but again, maybe it's also site-dependent and demographic-dependent. Very true. I have seen a few more um, tail or body of pancreas cancers uh, recently. Maybe it's just something that I didn't Tend notice. To run. Um, the other thing as well, potentially, is that um, people uh, with cancers in, not in the head of the pancreas are more likely to be in a fit enough state to be enrolled for this trial despite having metastatic disease because the head is not or the cancer is not in an area that abuts the biliary tree, the portal circulation, all that sort of stuff. So they're just... Maybe. Not as not as obstructed from a biliary perspective. Well, there's your answer, right? Maybe they all present later, um, later in the sense that they're not acutely unwell, so they're more likely to go on a trial because if you've got obstructive, you know, let's say you've got an obstructive lesion in the biliary tract and maybe it's spread to the liver, it's a lot harder to control that one um, for a long term than it is, let's say, you've got a body or tail of pancreas. Yeah, and as we know with gemabraxane. Um, the nabpaclitaxel component, uh, the second your bilirubin goes up, it becomes very, very toxic very quickly. So these patients clearly would have had to have had uh, a fairly good liver function. So this is a positive study. Let's get that out of the way because there are a lot of buts that follow that statement. Um, the overall survival primary endpoint, um, Naliri Fox, was better. The median overall survival was 11 months versus 9 months hazard ratio of 0.83, and a p-value of 0.04. So statistically significant. Still only a couple of months improvement. And probably, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably about the same time as uh, the same uh, overall survival duration, again, doing cross, uh, cross-trial cross analyses when we're not supposed to, of Folfirinox, or at very least a similar duration. Interesting, isn't it, that, you know, we're trying a new drug and the overall survival did not differ um, in the, I guess, the intervention arm. But, yeah... It's, it's a, the new drug, same as the old drug. Same as the old drug, but I have, I have from a personal anecdotal experience, I had, I had a patient a while back on liposome or in a, TCAN in a trial we were doing, and I found the response... This is N equals 1. Phenomenal. This guy had a CA 19.9. There was something like 60 or 70,000. And every fortnight he'd come in and every blood test I would do, you'd just see a dramatic drop in his tumor markers. And well tolerated, surprisingly. N equals that 1. Is a, that is interesting. But as you say, N equals 1. Yeah. Um, in terms of the subgroup analysis for overall survival, uh, now Larry Fox did sort of do numerically better, but there are an awful lot of these subgroups that are crossing that line of equivalence. So you can't really, you can probably take even less than usual away from these uh, forest plots. In terms of the PFS, again, a modest benefit. Um, Median progression-free survival in Nelleri Fox was 7.4, Gem Abraxane 5.6 months. So hazard ratio 0.69, everyone goes, whoa, a hazard ratio with starting with 0.6 uh, in a pancreatic cancer patient uh, pancreatic cancer study but the actual numbers are sort of less than two months so m- modest mild to modest benefit um, there was a much more overt benefit i guess in terms of the subgroup analysis um, in the pfs versus the os um, area 
uh, with the response rate, uh, Josh, this is uh, interesting uh, that the um, patients with uh, Naliri Fox did do better, but not again, not significantly. The objective response rate, and this was by centralized review, was 41.8% in the um, uh, experimental arm versus 36% in the control arm. So benefit of uh, 5%, 5 to 6% benefit. Again, I would I would love yeah five percent it's it's give or take in in a study with only a couple of hundred patients, but Michael I would love you to talk me through and I know you're going to do this but I'm just I want you to can you talk me through the toxicities and is there any dramatic difference when you use liposome or renotecan versus gem cytobine and nab paclitaxel or abraxane which yeah yeah. Well, would you believe that that was my next slide, Josh? Oh, my um, goodness. It's like we do this every week. <laughs> um, so the median treatment duration um, was longer than the Larry Fox group, 24 weeks versus 17. Again, pretty much everybody had a treatment-related adverse event. 99.7% versus 99.2%. That's of any grade. Uh, 95% of these um, adverse events, oh, sorry, I should say, uh, treatment emergent, so on trial as opposed to treatment related. Um, 95% in the Naliri Fox group were thought to be due to the treatment, 92% in the Gemberaxan group. So they're both toxic. But in terms of the actual makeup of the side effects, it seems like the trend was that uh, Naliri Fox had more non hematological toxicity um, in that uh, Gem Napaclitaxel did have higher rates of neutropenia and febrile neutropenia, both of any grade and grade three to four, so severe, um, and higher rates of anemia and thrombocytopenia as well. So cytopenias, gemabraxane appears to be more toxic than Nellyri Fox, which I thought was interesting because the, even if the liposomal urine TCAN component wasn't going to be a problem in this regard, you've still got the oxaliplatin, which is notorious for being quite um, myelosuppressive. But... Naliri Fox did cause a lot of non-hematological toxicities. So diarrhea of any grade, 70% versus 36%, so about double. And 20% of those were grade 3 to 4 versus 4.5% um, in the Gemna Paclitaxel group. Um, nausea of any grade, 60% versus 42%. And grade 3 to 4, 12% versus 26 Vomiting and uh, paresthesias were similarly high. Peripheral neuropathy was actually surprisingly similar in the two groups. Um, again, oxaliplatin is probably balanced out, though, by the paclitaxel. Um, interestingly, pyrexia, or fevers, um, was higher in the gemabraxane group, which is not something that I'd heard of as a side effect of gemabraxane, but it was present in 23% versus 10%. So I guess a lot of the things that... Um, are going to significantly impact a patient's quality of life in the pancreatic cancer space. Uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Naliri Fox does seem to be more toxic in that regard, but gemabraxane is uh, comes with a higher risk, at least in this study, of hematological toxicity, which again is interesting because I thought always thought that one of the benefits of gem napaclitaxel compared to fulfirinox, which is the current competing standard of care, is that there was less hematological toxicity. Josh, I don't know if you've had a similar experience. I have. I have quite a similar one, actually. You know, you kind of... You you balance the toxicities and the benefits of each, each ratio. And, of course, you've got those PBS restrictions when it comes to gemabraxane in Australia versus fulfirinox for first line as well. Yeah, so it's it's all about balance, I guess. Um, I did have a patient a little while back who had, unre- for an unrelated reason, had thrombocytopenia. She wasn't really a candidate for fulfirinox anyway, metastatic pancreatic cancer, obviously. But if she had been, and I had been presented with that choice, and she would have been up for anything, if I was trying to pick a regimen where she would have been less, uh, I would have guessed that she would have had a lower risk of thrombocytopenia. I would have chosen gemnapaclitaxel over fulvirinox. So this is interesting. It is an interesting trend. Anyway, uh, in summary, that's my 15 minute, 15 minute allocation gone. Um, in summary, um, so this is Napoli 3. The conclusions that uh, are in the actual presentation that we've got are much more optimistic and positive than 
um, I'm probably feeling, but hey, that's probably just because I'm jaded um, uh, about pancreatic cancer studies. Yes, there is a statistically significant uh, prolongation of overall and progression-free survival compared to gemcitabine and apaclitaxel. Um, but the absolute benefit still remains small. We're still really, really struggling to get these people over the 12-month mark in terms of overall survival for metastatic disease. On the flip side, um, about a third of these patients had quite diffuse disease with metastatic sites at three or more sites. So I think that it remains to be seen if this becomes more clinically, uh, more widely clinically used, then we'll be able to see much like, you know, the gemabraxane, fulfurinox debate that we had um, in our pancreatic cancer episode. Um, it will sort of, it might be able to shoulder its way in and, and convert a few people, but uh, at this point I'm still sort of sceptical. I think it would have also been quite interesting if uh, to see if they had compared fulfurinox with nelirifox um, to actually try and hone down what benefit the substitution, because it's, it's, it's a substitution, obviously, it's not really an addition of liposomal irinotecan has compared to just standard irinotecan. Maybe they weren't as confident in the positive result, I don't know. Maybe, but that you hit the nail on the head with the final sentence, Michael. Like, we want it against Fulfurinox. I don't want to see it against Gemabraxane. Yeah, I, I think that it's sort of a bit of an apples to oranges um, comparison, uh, because... I don't think that you're going to necessarily convert people away from gemaraxane with Nellery Fox if perfectly good fulfurinox, which by the by will be a lot cheaper, is I don't think you're going to convert people with this study. Probably not. Anyway, that was Napoli 3, a <laughs> typically cynical and dour ending to a pancreatic study that had so much promise. But Josh, I believe you have a couple of updates for us on studies that we have already looked at. I have, Michael. So we've got one new trial and I've got two updates. Would you like me to talk about the updates first? Well, look, I know how excited you are about the new trial. So why don't we save that until last? Okay, we'll save that. So I've got to always leave them wanting more. So much more. I'll do this briefly because we have spoken about, I think at least the Checkmate 486 study in one of our prior episodes. Let's talk about the background for those that haven't, either don't remember, don't want to remember, or have not listened to that episode. Defin- definitely the middle one. The middle one. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about people with advanced es- esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, which is one of the predominant types of esophageal malignancies. What do we know about this? When it's advanced, it's got a poor prognosis. And chemotherapy, while it does work, again, doesn't give us the duration of response and the long-term control that we need. We do know that there has been a significant overall survival benefit in patients with nivolumab, which is the immunotherapy, it's a checkmate study, plus chemotherapy, and nivolumab plus ipilimumab, so that's the CTLA-4 component, versus chemotherapy alone in previously treated patients with advanced esophageal squamous cell carcinoma in in a primary analysis of a phase 3 checkmate 648 study. So that's kind of the background. We know IPI and NEVO work. We know NEVO and chemo work in advanced studies. This is the long-term follow-up of that study. To briefly talk about the follow-up and the trial design, because it can get confusing when there's multiple arms, this was an international, randomized, open-label phase 3 trial. There has been 28.8 months of follow-up, Michael, and the patients that were included were unresectable, advanced, recurrent, or metastatic squamous cell esophageal carcinoma, no prior systemic therapy for advanced disease, good performance status, and they were put in three categories, one being baseline chemo, two being just immunotherapy, and three being immunotherapy combined with the chemotherapy. The co-primary endpoints, so what did they want to know, was overall survival and progression-free survival in patients who had pdl one of greater than or equal to 1%. And the secondary endpoint was overall survival and progression-free survival in everyone. 
Now, immunotherapy was continued until disease progression, um, unacceptable toxicity, or withdrawal from the study. When we look at the, I'm going to talk about the all randomized. So this is all PDO1 analysis, and then I'll talk about the greater than one percent median overall survival. Michael coming out on top by one month was nivolumab and chemotherapy at 12.8 months with a hazard ratio of 0.78, and nivolumab plus ipilimumab was 12.7 months with a hazard ratio of 0.77. Um. And chemotherapy was 10.7 months. Chemotherapy, very far behind. Very far behind. Distant third. Distant third. And then if you look at the median PFS, which I will talk about a little bit, Mike, and I think I'd love your input on this. Nivolumab and chemotherapy was 5.8 months with a hazard ratio of 0.83, whereas nivolumab plus ipilimumab was 2.9 months with a hazard ratio of 1.26. Already, just to flag this point, it's not statistically significant. So the PFS of Nevo and Ipi, not statistically significant. And realistically, if you look at just that value, you'll be like, does it actually do anything? Obviously, it does because you look at the overall survival, but PFS is not there. It's similar to a trial we talked about last week or two weeks ago, Michael, with um, uh, 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 renal cell carcinoma. It's not a good look for the epineva, though. Basically, the summary of this is that hazard ratios over one are bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we don't... <laughs> and, we, we don't see them very often, mainly because anything with a hazard ratio over one tends not to find its way onto this show. But the it is very interesting and does show how the paradigm of PFS being a surrogate for OS has really been changed, really by immunotherapy, or significantly by immunotherapy. There were always a few cases here or there, but immunotherapy makes it sort of uh, uh, common uh, or... or it, immunotherapy makes it much more of a trend. The main thing, I guess, is that the w- w- when we went through this study before, we, had, we basically said that there is no reason to use ipinevo for gastric cancer, uh, gastroesophageal cancer. And I'm guessing, Josh, that this update does not change that. It muddies the water a little bit, Michael. Sorry to mm. sorry to change change the tune. It does muddy the water slightly, and I will talk about that right now. Dang it! Okay, <laughs> objective response rate. I love objective response rate. About forty seven um, percent in the nivolumab plus chemotherapy. And remember, we spoke about this that when we have visceral crises and we've got just immunotherapy, we love to give a bit of chemo or something else to try and rush the control because it's usually a two to three month bracket to get immunotherapy to work. So objective response rate, 47%. When if you look at the nivolumab was 27%. So nivolumab and ipilimumab. So it was 27%, which is exactly the same as chemotherapy for an objective response rate. Okay. And then you're going, oh my gosh, like, why don't we just give everyone near volume ad plus chemotherapy? Then you got the duration of response. So how long did this treatment work for? And it was actually worked for longer in the nivolumab and the ipilimumab. So that was 11.1 months and it was only 8.1, 8.2 months in the nivolumab and chemotherapy arm. I'm not even going to mention just chemotherapy. So everything favors nivolumab plus chemo except for duration of response, which is really difficult to maybe digest a little bit. It would be interesting to see, like, the raw numbers. Mm. Because as we know, with immunotherapy, you do have these... uh, In other tumor streams, it's, you know, 20%. In gastric cancer, it's probably less. Um, But this small percentage of patients who has really, really long responses. And are we just really seeing a handful of those that are skewing the medium somewhat? That would be my question as to whether that explains it. Because if you've got a handful of patients that have a prolonged response, fantastic, really good outcomes, but it's not necessarily indicative of an overall trend because 
if your choices are you have all or nothing really you have a long response or no response which is sort of how i'm looking at that p the pfs mm. along with the um and, and reconciling it with the response rate you either have a really good response a longer response than with chemo and nevo versus nothing that's it and so I do wonder about that. And then we'll talk about the greater than one percent PDO one. So this is the other one. And what we found is that everything or immunotherapy, of course, looked better. But if for the numbers, overall survival was fifteen versus thirteen months. So fifteen favoring nivolumab plus chemotherapy versus thirteen months for the nivolumab plus ibulumumab, with a hazard ratio of zero point five nine and zero point six two respectively. So better hazard ratios you can see there so 40 40 percent benefit over standard of care really then the pfs was 6.8 and four months so 6.8 months for nivolumab and chemotherapy and four months for nivolumab and ipilimumab again nivolumab and ipilimumab crossed that confidence interval and it was 1.04 so not statistically significant and nivolumab plus chemotherapy was 0.67 again statistically significant for a progression-free survival objective response rate went up for both of them so 53 percent for nivolumab alone and the 35 percent for nivolumab and ipilimumab and duration of response also crept up a little bit and was 8.4 and 11.8 months respectively the first being with the chemotherapy the second being the dual agent immunotherapy looking and i'll just and we're, we're going over so much over time michael looking at toxicities all grade for nivolumab and chemotherapy was 96%, so treatment-related adverse events, and grade 3 or grade 4 was 49%. And if you look at nivolumab and IPI, 80% for treatment-related adverse events and 33% for grade 3 and grade 4. Most common immunotherapy, endocrine, gastrointestinal, hepatic, pulmonary, renal, skin. And the slides kind of break that down. And so therefore lies the key, I think, Michael, is that if you have someone that's frail and you have someone who you don't think will tolerate any chemotherapy, you you might consider ipinevo, I think, given the toxicity. If you can get it. If you can get it. Um, and, you know, if they're, they're robust, I would probably be erring on the nivolumab and the chemotherapy at this stage. Um, my, my question to you, Josh, in that scenario is if you have someone who is so frail that you're not even going to give them heavily dose reduced Folfox Nevo or even 5-FU Nevo, if all they can cope with is sort of a sprinkling, are you going to give them Ipi Nevo? Probably not. I think you're playing with die, or playing with uh, your dice, and I think you know you could trial IP and then maybe drop it, and then just give nivolumab mm. again. I, I'd love to see what a single agent nevo would show. Um, yeah, it's hard. I, I mean, the, the the question is, what would single agent nevo actually do? Um, my my takeaway with this is that IP nevo is still not giving me enough to convince me to actually use it. Every everything comes with sort of a an asterisk, I guess. the The results are contradictory, mm. um, and honestly, I would I would prefer to give. And this is just me. I'm not saying that your thoughts are any less valid. But if it was me, I would think you know trial, just really slimming down the chemo, um, and giving some form of chemotherapy agent with the nevo because that's where the good quality of it good such as it is good quality of evidence is mm. um rather than ipi and it, i mean it's academic for for us in australia because you you can't get ipi nevo for this indication the drug company won't supply it and i don't think the pbs would ever fund it until it costs like zero two cents and you can buy it and you can buy it on a street corner yeah although no one's going to want to buy it um i will <laughs> i i'm going to they want to buy it obviously now but when it's not worth anything Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll briefly talk about Checkmate 649 in three sentences or less. Um, this was an update on a phase three study looking at first line nivolumab and chemotherapy versus chemotherapy and advanced gastric and gastroesophageal cancer and esophageal adenocarcinoma. So very similar 
um, to the first study I just spoke about, but this also included gastric cancers. I think that's something to sort of flag here, Michael. Um, they've, I think they've almost used the same poor overall survival, median overall survival. We already knew that. We know there was a significant overall survival and progression-free survival benefit noted in nivolumab and chemotherapy versus chemo in the gastric setting or in the prior outcomes, and this is the three-year update. Um, for this particular trial, they had, again, three arms, so it was untreated, unresectable, advanced cancer, immunotherapy and chemo. Chemo alone, either um, Zelox or Folfox, um, so fluorouracil, oxaliplatin and leucovorin, or capecitabine and oxaliplatin. Um, and then the third arm was ipilimumab and nivolumab. It's almost plum identical to Checkmate 648, uh, really. What we found, I think they copied. I think one of them copied the other same word. Maybe six four nine copied six four eight just based on the number, but I can't say that <laughs> for sure. What we found is really immunotherapy plus chemo trumped immunotherapy. Um, just to kind of talk about it briefly. Hazard ratio of zero point seven nine for overall survival with an overall survival in the intervention arm of thirteen point seven versus eleven point six. Progression free survival seven point seven versus six point nine favoring the intervention arm with a hazard ratio of 0.79. Objective response rate almost 60% with nivolumab and chemo versus 46% in chemo alone. And then you've got the duration of response was 8.5 versus 6.9 months, uh, 6.9 being just chemo. That's all randomized patients. When you look at the pd one expression, they, they chose greater than 5%. That bumped all the numbers up. Um, interesting objective response rate only increased by 2% to 60%. Um, and the median duration of response was 9.6 in the nivolumab arm versus 8.5 in the original nivolumab arm. So you definitely saw some benefit, uh, but not a huge amount. When we look at, if we break down, so this is interesting actually. What they did do is they broke it down by pdl one and MSI status. And what we found with the pd one CPS combined score, right? Um, we found if it was greater than 10%, the objective response rate was actually really similar to everything unless it was less than 1%. That's really interesting, right? So you're still getting that response. And the median overall survival was median overall survival definitely was better in the greater than 10% um pdl1 cps score and the unstratified hazard ratio looking at msi so um msi high so that's microsatellite instability that's that's high meaning you've got genes that are uh, deficient, meaning your repair mechanisms are broken and you're going to have more errors and more mutations in your cells. Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And what you found is that the uncertified hazard ratio in the MSI high component was 0.34. And for the stable, meaning they've got those repair mechanisms, it was 0.79. So a pretty big difference if you've got a patient who has an MSI high. So look out for that. Adverse events, 95 in the intervention arm versus 89%. And again, lots of it kind of covered really. The standard immunotherapy toxicity is nothing that we haven't spoken about previously. So what we found, it had ongoing pro- progression to survival and overall survival with statistical significance in the untreated population. And it was seen in all subgroups, enriched mildly. Enriched a little bit by higher pd one cutoffs. Yes, PFS, but I think overall survival, not a huge amount. I think a month at best is not something to sort of jump up and down about. So even if you had a less than 1%, I would probably give them the intervention arm because you're still going to get benefit for a standard of care. That was the longest three sentences I've ever heard in my life. Well, it's me, so... <laughs> it's <laughs> That's very true. No, uh, no, it's uh, very short for you, but also very good. Uh, very good summary. I think that the main thing that I took away from that summary, Josh, was the question we asked when we did the original episode on these is when CPS testing for gastric cancer in our area of practice becomes widely available, do you sort of not give Nevo to the people who are... Um, lower in the pd one CPS um, 
rankings, as it were, um, or do you just give it to everybody? And I think that even though there's, you know, this confirms the original study that people with higher CPS did better, that uh, response rate, I think you said, um, being sort of similar across the CPS um, uh, sort of levels, um, makes me think that we are just con- going to continue to give it to everyone. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that, Michael. And just to, I'm just going to clarify the less than 1% and the more than 1% because that's kind of that cutoff. So less than 1% when you look at overall survival, it was 13.1 versus 12.5 months. So still statistically significant, but with a hazard ratio of 0.95, favoring the immunotherapy arm. But if you look at the objective response rate, for the less than 1% in the combined positive score of pd one it was 51 versus 41%. So you get a 10% difference of someone going to respond irrespective of their pd one right? So what I mean by that is that if you just gave chemo alone, there's 10% of patients that will not receive any benefit from the chemotherapy because they're not going to respond. By giving the immunotherapy, they will respond at least for a time. Yeah, so it is, but it is sort of reinforcing that what we're currently doing, at least in Australia, by giving sort of Folfox Nevo to everyone, and we're doing it largely because A, we can, um, and B, we're so starved of agents in the gastric and gastroesophageal space that we'll just latch onto anything, um, that uh, that is probably the right way to go moving forward until something definitively supersedes it. Josh is nodding his approval. They, exactly. Until something supersedes it, this is the best we've got, and it definitely shows improvement. Michael, do you want to jump to your next one? I will. We're getting to the more avant-garde uh, side of the uh, podcast. So my next study is a study called Spotlight, and this does not refer to the fantastic Best Picture winning film from a few years ago um, starring uh, Michael Keaton, Rachel McAdams, and uh, Mark Ruffalo. Although go go and watch it if you if you're in for a good afternoon. You just wanted to no, just wanted to do a cultural thing. Um, also, just wanted to do a cultural thing. I am a man of culture. I remember the blockbuster I wanted to talk about. It was called About Time, with Rachel McAdams. Actually, one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Also, go watch that hey, one. We're at, we're morphing into a, a film recommendation. A rom com <laughs> film recommendation. <laughs> I don't know if I called Jaws a rom com. <laughs> um, anyway, so Spotlight is a phase three study of a new agent, a completely new agent that is targeting a new molecular target. And these are always very exciting. So the agent is Zolbituximab and the target is the Claudine 18.2 protein. And I'll go into what uh, Claudine 18.2 is first. So it's a tight junction protein. But what is very, very interesting about this marker is that it is found in very, very small amounts. It's almost not expressed in non-malignant tissue. So it's only present in the gastric sense, uh, in the tight junctions between cells, and its, f- and its function is to prevent the leakage of hydrochloric acid through the non-standard uh, cellular pathways. So... If you stain a non-malignant um, section of gastric tissue for um, Claudin 18.2, you'll get almost no staining at all. However, the overexpression of this marker is associated with the development of cancer, and and the presence of uh, malignant tissue mean is generally associated with a higher staining of this marker. So this has all of the ingredients of something very, very exciting. And naturally, Zolbituximab is a antibody to Claudin 18.2 that induces both antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity um, as well as complement-dependent cytotoxicity. So it's attacking the cancer cells on multiple uh, pathways. Now, Spotlight is a follow-up to the FAST trial. That is a randomized phase 2 study of Zolbituximab plus EOX. Now, that's epirubicin and oxaliplatin, 
which is not really something that is uh, that is used in the gastric space these days, and that's a that's sort of an area of discussion, versus um, epirubicin, oxaliplatin, and capecitabine, uh, or EOX, versus EOX alone for patients with locally advanced, inoperable, recurrent, or metastatic um, Claudin 18.2 positive gastric or gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. Um, so the FAST study was a phase two trial with uh, less than 200 patients. It did show both a PFS and overall survival benefit. And so naturally, this uh, uh, gets spun off into a phase three study, which is Spotlight. Um, so it's a global randomized double blind phase three trial. And much like the FAST study, Um, Patients were enrolled who had previously untreated locally advanced or metastatic gastric or GOJ cancer, adenocarcinoma, I should say. They had to be clawed in 18.2 positive. And what that means is moderate to strong staining on the tumor cells. So they had to have a staining of this clawed in 18.2 in greater than 75% of the tumor cells. Um, they had to be HER2 negative as well because um, uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan is really dominating that space at this point. Um, and their ECOG status had to be 0 to 1 as is standard. Uh, they were randomized. And this is another interesting thing about this study, Josh, is the two the two treatment arms were zolbituximab um, plus modified Folfox, modified Folfox 6, which is a much more standard regimen for advanced gastric and GOJ cancer than EOX. Um, and you had that for four cycles. And then you dropped the oxaliplatin. So normally we do sort of, it depends on sort of where you are, but you do 12 cycles of Folfox and you might drop the oxaliplatin after eight or nine cycles to prevent um, uh, peripheral neuropathy. But here you're only getting four cycles before you drop the oxaliplatin and going to 5-fluorouracil and zolpituximab. And that was compared with a placebo where a placebo control arm, which was basically the same chemo backbone, but, backbone, but obviously without the zolpituximab. The primary endpoint was pro- progression-free survival, and the secondary endpoints were overall survival, the time to first confirmed deterioration, um, as, uh, as well as using the uh, quality of life scores, um, physical function, and the um, QLQ pain scores that we've mentioned previously. Additional endpoints were overall response rate, duration of response, safety, as well as patient-reported outcomes. I won't belabor the baseline st- uh, characteristics too much. Um, suffice to say, Median average was a little. Uh, median average age was a little over sixty. Um, the primary site, the majority of patients had gastric as opposed to GOJ cancer, um, so we might call this an inverse checkmate study. There was a fairly even spread between ECOGs of zero to one, uh, and coming off the checkmate um, updates that you just gave, Josh, uh, the PDL one CPS score was greater than five in thirteen percent of patients. This was sort of done ad, ad hoc. Um, So they sort of did it as they went. They didn't really stratify for it, uh, but it's something to be uh, noted. So in terms of progression-free survival, so we've built this up. We've built this up. This is a very promising thing. And uh, while the results are significant, they are once again fairly modest. So in the Zolbituximab, um, the progression-free survival was 10.6 months and the overall survival was 18.2 months compared with the placebo arm where the progression-free survival was 8.6 months and the overall survival was 15.5 months. So what is interesting, what I find interesting about these numbers as well is that the overall survival and the progression-free survival for the placebo arms are actually quite good. If you look at the checkmate arms from memory, the median overall survival in the arm that just got chemo by itself was, what, about 8 to 12, 9 to 12 months, Josh? Yeah, Josh is nodding, so that's good. My memory isn't failing me just yet. Whereas here it's 15 months. So um, that sort of raises a question. And of course, this is the exact reason you don't do cross-trial comparisons is because this might just be a different group of people. But um, I guess that is a question about, or raises a question about whether people with this um, uh, Claudin 18.2 heavy staining are maybe more susceptible to chemo. I don't know. That's just me um, sort of spitballing. The 
Zolpituximab arm had higher rates, as one would expect, in the 12-month and 24-month uh, survival, both progression-free and overall. However, and there's always a however. Always the a ov- catch, Michael. Always a catch, always an asterisk. The overall response rate was actually lower in the Zolpituximab arm. And honestly, I don't know how to explain this one. Only slightly lower. It was 60.7 versus 62.1%. But... The fact that it is not significantly higher is interesting. The duration of response was only slightly higher, 8.5 versus 8.1 months. It just, sorry, Michael, I know you're you're doing such a wonderful job going through these statistics. It's it's a really interesting trial, isn't it? I think from a basic sciences and cell-based perspective, that if you're if you're targeting what theoretically is driving this cancer, despite, yes, there are some modest improvements, there's a lot of things that don't really add up. Like, it doesn't add up that the objective response rate is the same. It doesn't add up that if if you look at the, you know, partial response and the stable disease and even the, the complete response, like, they're still quite similar um, in their arm. And, yes, there is a m- marginal benefit with the hazard ratio for the PFS and their, you know, overall survival, there was also a benefit of a couple of months. Like, I don't know if it's the data they've used, because realistically, if you've got a benefit in overall survival, benefit in progression-free survival, I would expect to see better overall response and a better duration of response and a better objective response. Would you be able to maybe comment on that? I... I, this is something that I'll be very interested, or a study I would be very interested to see, like the post-clinical um, or the post-release data or potentially like the long-term follow-up, because the, like you say, a lot of this doesn't add up. It also doesn't even correspond necessarily with the phase two data, the FAST study. The benefit there was much more profound than the benefit here. And maybe, again, this is a case of they just happen to select a good placebo study or a good placebo cohort, so that's minimising the actual magnitude of benefit. Um, and the benefit would be better than uh, compared to what we would probably say the average survival for patients receiving chemo with metastatic gastric and gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma is. Um, but I guess the the other thing sort of in the back of my mind is... What if um, Claudin 18.2 is actually more of a surrogate? What if the actual target is something else that is associated with Claudin 0.82? Because there is sort of a a pre-clinical, like a, a scientific association with the incidence of cancer and the development, the growth of cancer and Claudin 18.2. But what this study is showing is that stopping it is blocking that target is not stopping the cancer in its tracks. It's not the CTLF4 and PDL1 in melanoma. It's not the EGFR or the ALK or the ROS in lung cancer. So that means to me that there is much more going on under the surface that's driving gastric cancer. It might be much more molecularly complex than a single target. And it might be one of those cases where there's not a convenient target. Yeah, I think you've that that you've summarized that perfectly. It's not the we don't have the key to the lock that we need for this. And this evidently is showing that it's not the primary driver. And if it's not the primary driver, it's not going to I suspect if we have a look at follow up and I'm hypothesizing and I'm always wrong when I hypothesize or suggest, but I suspect we're not gonna see any dramatic improvement and if anything Maybe new world outcomes to show more resistant, quicker, and you know the things as like the the tumor gets smart and overcomes this inhibition that we're trying to achieve. Or it might be a case of a a similar pathway to a, um, a, a the EGFR mutation in colorectal cancer associated with a KRAS mutation. This is a pathway that I think we've talked about before, where you can block the EGFR, which is the surface marker, probably the thing that you can stain for until the cows come home. But if there's a KRAS mutation, then that's just sort of turning over anyway. Maybe it's maybe we just need to find what the Claudin eighteen point two 
links to because if it's causing if it's associated with proliferation and growth of cancer it has to be driving something or something has to be driving Mm -hmm. it so if we find that man behind the man if we find the puppet master and actually attack that as opposed to the face which may be clawed in 18.2 then that might produce a more effective outcome but hey look we're just a couple of schmucks just talking on a podcast i'm sure that they're schmoozing i'm 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 sure that there are people much smarter than us slaving away uh in a lab trying to answer all of these questions that we're we're raising but it is after all of that build-up it is slightly disappointing to see that the benefit was not greater and it does raise a lot of questions exactly well we've already gone over our loss of time michael but i might quickly switch and summarize please do the last trial I'd like to talk about, and I'm not going to say three sentences or less, is the phase two study of the FGFR inhibition pemigatinib for previously treated metastatic colorectal cancer with FGF and FGFR alterations. I was really excited for this trial, and unfortunately, the outcomes were not what I wanted. So FGFR alterations have seen some pretty significant improvements in the cholangiocarcinoma space, which is be known to be ridiculously difficult to treat in those with FGFR2 fusion or other rearrangements. They wanted to know if patients who had FGF or FGFR alterations in colorectal cancer would you have the same effects. So they've got this multi-center single arm phase two trial. Um, they were given pemigatinib. It's a, it's a tablet. Day twenty one days on, three uh, seven days off. There's a three week cycle, and they were looking for our objective response rate and PFS and OFS are second response rates. I'm not going to get into the baseline characteristics because I don't think it's... Well, actually, I'll talk about one thing. So if you look at the FGFR mutations, so there was not a huge number, only 14 patients. No alteration in FGFR1 was found in 75%. Um, FGFR2 mutation was found in only... 15% and FGFR3 mutation was only found in 7.7%. So if you're looking at this, what you can see is that that's the tissue sample. And then if you go to the blood sample, the amplification of FGFR1 was in 88% and FGFR3, the no, inter, no alteration was found in 88.9%. And then let's look at the... Um, they've broken it down and said pemigatinib in metastatic colorectal cancer with FGFR alteration. So they've obviously excluded the patients that didn't have the alterations, which is interesting, Um, although that's not really how it reads. So when you have a look at the pemigatinib in metastatic colorectal cancer with FGF or FGFR alterations, this includes blood and tissue across multiple domains including fgfr1 fgfr2 and fgfr3 they found that there was it was terrible um so 90 percent had progressive disease one patient had stable disease and missing data in four patients so median progression free survival was 9.1 weeks so in, as a summary this trial was halted due to no partial complete response and pretty bad outcomes um which is sad the question is, was the resistance? The question is, are we not targeting the right mutation? Um, there's a number of things I, I don't know. Was it a patient cohort population issues? Because not everyone had the same... Do we need maybe an amplification rather than a mutation? You know, These are all sort of nuances in the genetic code. And if it's... I'm assuming it's a pan-FGFR inhibitor, but maybe you needed a target FGFR inhibitor. But... This just didn't seem to have any good outcome. Which is a shame because FGFR2s have held such have held mm. such promise. I know they've got some good initial signals in um, bladder cancer and uh, in your particular favourite mm-hmm. in gallbladder cancer, which is why I was very keen for you to, to see this trial without really having <laughs> looked at it. That will show me. Um, but... Um, it really, though, does come down to this idea that cancer is a heterogeneous disease and what works for one type of cancer will not necessarily work for others. Um, immunotherapy does diddly squat in prostate cancer, um, even though it obviously has very good responses elsewhere. So 
maybe, and you know, as you say, tiny, tiny trial um, with a significant proportion of its um, uh, population not even having FGR, FGFR mutations or alterations. Um, so tiny trials, so let's not close the book on FGFR inhibitors and pemigatinib yet, but not a good sign. No, not a good sign, but I think there's more to this story than what this trial shows because if one cancer like Calangio, which is so difficult to treat, has such a great response, why is it that this one doesn't? And again, you, you've, you've said you've said what I was thinking, Michael. That's why we do a podcast so well together. We're just They're, that good. We're just that good. Uh, we're so in sync. Um, is that, you know, we, there, there's multiple players involved with these cancers it's not a single mutation it's not a single alteration and although we finish on a slightly sad note there has been some interesting discussions today on oncology for the inquisitive mind about some trials not all not a lot of them are super exciting but there's definitely progression towards better outcomes and i think that's what we always aim for um Yesterday at time of recording was a year since President Biden has reinstated the moonshot, cancer moonshot, which is the aim to reduce morbidity and mortality by, I think, 25%. Um, and so obviously funding a lot more money into this kind of research. So uh, very exciting times ahead for our patients and hopefully us and what we can offer. But thus, like all of our episodes, it has to come to an end And on next week's episode, Michael and I will be investigating his brain. No, Michael (laughs) and I will be investigating neuro-oncology. We have avoided this topic for long enough, Michael, and my... My one of my favourite specialists, uh, Dr. Howen Sim, who is a wonderful neuro oncologist, would be mortified to know that I uh, have not spoken about it. But we will be talk- talking about brain neoplasms, primary brain neoplasms, so specifically um, GBMs, and there's been a huge change in the way we classify glioblastoma multiforme although the treatment hasn't really changed and the trials are still have a long way to go we are going to talk about what options our patients have so as always please subscribe follow our podcast let us know if there's something you would like to listen to um in two weeks time we will be talking about hormone receptor metastatic breast cancer so we've kind of got that in the pipeline as well um but we look forward to seeing you then and don't forget that we're also doing a fortnightly program on uh practical chemotherapy and immunotherapy side effects our next one is due out this wednesday and it will be on diarrhea so don't listen to that while you're eating but a practical guide to the management of chemotherapy induced diarrhea so there's plenty of this podcast plenty of me and josh And we are so (laughs) grateful that you've all joined us on this journey and we can't wait to have more discussions like today. We'll see you next time, everybody. See you.